live in animal burrows and free-living sewards, warthogs in particular. This we refer to as the sylvatic cycle. The other cycle also usually involves tampans, but in this instance, domestic pigs indigenous to the area rather than wild sewards provide the vertebrate host. Other than in southern and eastern Africa, the distribution of ASF virus in its free living state is not accurately known. In particular, the northerly and westerly extent of its occurrence remains to be accurately established. The West African situation is especially confusing, because, as already shown, ASF in domestic pigs has long been established there, and warthogs occur in parts of a number of countries of the region. However, whether ticks capable of transmitting ASF virus are also present, and if so, their status vis-à-vis -vis ASF virus infection remains to be determined. Likewise, the status of wild sewards with respect to infection with ASF virus is largely unknown. Therefore, with the exception of southern and eastern Africa, the maps you are now looking at showing the distribution of ASF virus in warthogs and tampans may not be entirely accurate. Other wild sewards that may be involved in the maintenance of ASF virus are bush pigs that are members of the genus Potamocerus and giant forest hogs of the genus Hylocerus. Although these species are resistant to the pathogenic effects of ASF virus, their importance in maintaining ASF virus in the field is not well understood. The transmission of ASF virus between its natural hosts is complex and cannot be dealt with in detail here. Nevertheless, an attempt will be made to describe the essential features. In the first place, it is important to appreciate that ASF virus replicates in both its vertebrate and invertebrate hosts, and is transmitted from one to the other. It therefore fulfills the criteria of an arbovirus, one of the few DNA viruses that does this. In order to understand how transmission in free-living hosts occurs, however, one needs to know a little about the biology and behavior of the wild sewards and the ticks involved. Warthogs spend their nights in underground burrows that they leave during the day to forage. Burrows are often situated at the bases of termite mounds where termite-eating animals have initiated the excavation. Any other suitable cavity may also be occupied by warthogs, and culverts under roads, for example, are commonly used. Female warthogs often live in groups, known as sounders, consisting of their youngest offspring, generally two to four, and perhaps one or two yearlings born to them a year previously, as well as one or two other adult females and their offspring. Males live apart from females as individuals or in small groups for the greater part of the year, except during the breeding season. In subtropical and temperate climates, warthogs have a distinct breeding season. In southern Africa, they mate in May, and the young arrive in early summer. Young warthogs spend about a month in the burrow before beginning to accompany their mothers on foraging expeditions. It is within these first few weeks of life that warthogs generally become infected with ASF virus by ticks feeding on them. This is despite the fact that the baby warthogs usually acquire antibodies to the virus in colostrum obtained from their mothers within a few hours of birth. During the acute stage of infection with ASF virus in warthogs, which lasts about a week, viremia sufficient to infect ticks feeding on them may occur. Thereafter, viremias are below the threshold of infection for ticks. This implies that, generally, ticks only acquire infection from warthogs over a period of a month or two during the time when young warthogs are present in the burrows. Burrow-dwelling ticks that feed on warthogs are classified as members of the Ornithodorus mobata complex, whose common name is the Eyeless Tampan. These ticks are morphologically identical to hut-dwelling Ornithodorus mobata that parasitize humans and transmit relapsing fever caused by a rickettsia. The tampans 
unlike ixodid or hard-shelled ticks, do not remain attached to their hosts for long periods, because they are able to engorge rapidly, usually in less than an hour. They therefore spend most of their time in cracks and crevices in the walls and roofs of burrows, or in the soil of the burrow floor. Presumably, when the warthogs are asleep at night, the tampans climb onto their bodies and engorge before dropping off to return to their hideouts. In the sequence you are now watching, shot over a period of approximately 45 minutes, tampans are feeding on a tranquilized pig. Note the rapid engorgement and how towards the end of the blood meal they begin to excrete clear coxal fluid from glands at the base of the forelegs. In this way, they concentrate the blood that they have engorged. Note also the white guanine, their urinary waste, which is also frequently excreted while they are engorging. Feces are never excreted. They are stored in the tick's body until death, because these ticks have no alimentary opening. ASF virus is transmitted to warthogs in the saliva of ticks, but the coxal fluid and guanine also contain infectious virus and could induce infection if they were to contaminate a cut or abrasion on the skin of the warthog. Female tampans, which may be as large as medium-sized buttons, lay clusters of round brown eggs a little larger than a pinhead after each blood meal. These hatch into small pale brown larvae with only six legs that molt without feeding and become first stage nymphae with a full complement of eight legs. These first stage nymphae need to find a blood meal in order to molt into second stage nymphae. This process continues for five nymphal stages and the next molt gives rise to adult males and females. ASF virus is transmitted in at least three different ways within tampan populations. Transovarially, transstadially, and sexually. Thus, a small proportion of larvae that have never fed may be infected with ASF virus, and all subsequent developmental stages of those ticks are likewise infected. Sexual transmission in these ticks is interesting in that it occurs from male to female only. The reason presumably being that coitus in this species involves the male placing a bag or spermotheca into the genital opening of the female. There is evidence from a number of localities in southern and central Africa that ASF virus is maintained in a cycle between indigenous domestic pigs and eyeless tampans that live in the structures that such pigs are housed in at night. The best studied of these areas straddles the border between the Mchinji district of Malawi, the Angonia district in northern Mozambique, and the Chipata area of eastern Zambia. There are probably similar situations in Angola, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Uganda, and possibly elsewhere. In the Mchinji Angonia area, a high proportion of pigs have antibody to ASF virus, indicating that they have survived infection with ASF virus. Usually, infection of domestic pigs by ASF virus results in an acute and highly fatal disease, and the pigs die before they develop antibody to the virus. In Mchinji, Tampans infected with ASF virus were found to be prevalent in the colas constructed of tree trunks, branches and thatch in which pigs are housed at night. It is presumed that there is a cycle of infection between the ticks and pigs that occurs predominantly within the colas. However, it appears that ASF is sometimes endemic in domestic pigs in the absence of ticks. Outside areas where ASF occurs endemically in domestic pigs, that is, both in areas where it is maintained in the sylvatic cycle, as well as areas free of infection, explosive outbreaks of ASF occur when the infection is introduced into domestic pig populations. Such events are characterized by large-scale mortality in a short period of time, and the infection spreads rapidly from piggery to piggery 
because once the infection is established in domestic pigs, it is highly contagious, unlike the situation in warthogs. Sometimes such outbreaks are self-limiting because so many pigs are killed by the virus that there are not enough individuals left to sustain the infection. Conversely, in other situations, the infection is sustained, presumably by a steady source of naive pigs. Eventually, some co-adaption between the virus and pig population may occur, with or without the agency of ticks, and ASF becomes endemic. Pigs that survive the acute phase of ASF may be contagious for up to two months, although the virus may be detected in the lymphoid tissues of such animals for up to about six months. Long-term carriers probably do not occur, although data on this are inadequate. Acutely infected domestic pigs are highly contagious because large quantities of virus may be present in all their secretions and excretions. These secretions and excretions are capable of generating fomites and may contaminate vehicles, animal handling facilities, and the hands or clothing of people. In this way, the infection may be transmitted indirectly. Contaminated feed is often responsible for the spread of ASF, especially untreated swill that may contain pieces of pig tissue derived from the carcasses of infected pigs slaughtered to produce fresh or processed pork. Virus that has survived sausage or ham production processes and subsequently entered the swine food chain has frequently been incriminated as the cause of epidemics. ASF virus is relatively stable in the environment and is able to survive for long periods of time if kept cool, for example in slurry. Biting flies, such as Stomoxus species, may transmit the infection mechanically. In domestic pigs, infection usually occurs either via the bites inflicted by infected tampans or by ingestion of virus-contaminated feedstuffs. In the latter case, initial infection occurs in the tonsils or dorsal pharyngeal mucosa, from where it spreads to the mandibular or retropharyngeal lymph nodes. Thereafter, hematogenous spread occurs and levels of viremia may reach 100 million infectious doses per milliliter of blood. The virus has a predilection for the antigen-presenting cells of the lymphoreticular system. In acute cases, these cells undergo cytolysis, while in chronic and subacute cases, these cells become hyperplastic. This is often accompanied by hypergamma globulinemia, the cause of hemorrhage, edema, and effusion into body cavities in acute cases is complex, but involves thrombocytopenia and platelet aggregation, with concomitant coagulopathy and dysfibrinogenemia, as well as impaired vascular integrity. In outbreaks of ASF in Africa, acute disease is characteristic affecting pigs of all ages, and very few recover. The incubation period varies between 5 to 15 days for infection transmitted orally, while for transmission by tick bite it is usually 4 to 5 days. Death occurs between 2 to 9 days in 90% of cases. The first sign of illness that usually goes undetected is a sudden rise in body temperature to between 41 and 42 degrees Celsius, followed by listlessness and partial or complete anorexia. This is often soon followed by a swaying gait with apparent weakness in the hind legs. Within a day or two, increasing congestion and cyanosis of the skin tail, ears, snout, lower parts of the legs and abdomen become apparent in white-skinned pigs. The animals become increasingly listless, have rapid shallow respiration and huddle together. Sometimes pigs show signs of abdominal pain. They may develop mild mucopurulent ocular and nasal discharges. Vomiting is common and some animals become constipated with blood-stained mucus on the feces. 
Others develop diarrhea with fresh or blackened blood adhering to the base of the tail and perineum. Sows frequently abort early in the clinical course of the disease and at all stages of pregnancy. Animals in extremis sometimes have blood-stained and frothy discharges from the nose due to the lung edema, which is often the immediate cause of death. Clinical signs in subacute cases, that is, those lasting longer than about three weeks, are characterized by irregular remittent fever, anorexia, and loss of condition. Pneumonia is frequent with coughing and dyspnea, especially after even slight exertion. Some animals develop cardiac insufficiency that may result in intermandibular edema and sudden death during forced exercise. Painful swelling of the joints of the limbs may occur with edema of periarticular tissues. Some longer-term survivors become emaciated and may develop areas of necrosis, abscessation and ulceration of the skin overlying bony protuberances. In white-skinned pigs, purplish discoloration of the skin, particularly the ventral abdomen and extremities, is usual, often accompanied by hemorrhage. When the carcass is opened, organs appear congested and widespread hemorrhages are evident. Abdominal lymph nodes, especially the hepatogastric and mesenteric lymph nodes, may be enlarged and resemble blood clots. Moderate accumulation of clear to bloody fluid occurs in body cavities. The spleen is usually, but not always, enlarged and congested, with pinpoint hemorrhages on the capsule. Peripheral infarcts are occasionally present. Petechial hemorrhages may be evident in the kidneys, which are often swollen. Lung edema is a common feature of ASF. The lungs do not collapse when the thoracic cavity is opened, and they appear moist with prominent interlobular septa. Froth is present in the trachea. Widespread hemorrhages are often present on both surfaces of the heart. The lining of the glandular stomach is often severely congested and may reveal erosion and ulceration. In subacute and chronic cases, lymph nodes may be enlarged and firm, and varying degrees of interstitial pneumonia may be present. Microscopic pathological changes include cariorexis of lymphoreticular cells in the spleen and lymph nodes, fibrinoid vasculitis, acute glomerulonephritis and nephrosis, interstitial pneumonia, and lymphocytic meningitis. The well-recognized acute, highly contagious and lethal nature of ASF, as it typically occurs in Africa, especially in areas close to endemic regions, should alert veterinarians and animal health workers to the presence of the disease. Autopsies revealing generalized hemorrhage with enlargement and hemorrhage of lymphatic tissues should result in a presumptive diagnosis that necessitates laboratory examination for confirmation or exclusion of the suspicion. Specimens required to confirm a presumptive diagnosis are lymphoid tissues, lymph nodes, spleen, tonsils, preferably submitted on ice to a laboratory equipped and authorized to handle highly contagious agents. In the absence of ice, the specimen should